In this video, I'm going to be reminding you of the things that we must know for calculus AB, the list of things that we are expected to have memorized. And so I'm just going to start with the beginning of the course and kind of move all the way through to the end. So we started with limits, and there's really only a few things that we need to just know about limits. And that would be, you know, limit existing and limit not existing. So we say that the limit of f of x as x approaches c exists if, well, the two one-sided limits as x approaches c exist and degree. Okay. This could be a situation where this circle was filled in and it was a continuous function, or it could be a situation where it was discontinuous, and that would be a removable discontinuity. Okay. The limit doesn't exist at a place where the two one-sided limits don't agree. Okay, so maybe we have something like that. Okay. It would also fail to exist at a place where we had like a vertical asymptote or something like that. Okay, this is limit existing and limit non-existing. We also need to know the definition of continuous. Okay, a function is continuous at an x value if the limit of the function as x approaches that value is equal to the value of the function. And so, you know, suppose we've got a limit existing, okay, that would be discontinuous because there's a hole in the graph. But if the value of the function is equal to the limit, then it's going to be continuous at that point. That's the idea. We also need to know about a consequence of continuity, the intermediate value theorem. That if a function is continuous on a closed interval and we've got some y value between f of a and f of b, then y0 is equal to f of c for some c between a and b. And I'll draw you a picture. So suppose we've got ourselves a function that's continuous on this interval. And we're just going to say for ease, this is f of a, and you know, that's f of b. If we've got some, you know, y value, y0 in here, and the function is continuous, I have to cross over that line. Whoops, pardon me. I'm going to erase those. This horizontal line right here, I've got to have some sort of intersection for some c in there. That's what we're saying with the intermediate value theorem. Okay. Then we started talking about derivatives, okay, and the definition of the derivative a limit of rise over run as run goes towards zero. And we also had kind of an alternative definition. And this is the definition of the derivative at a point, the slope of a curve at one x value. And so this is also the same as the limit as x approaches c of f of x minus f of c oops, that in there, divided by x minus c. Another version of the limit of rise over run as run goes towards zero. We also learned that the derivative is a function that will give you the slope of a curve at any x value. Okay. And from there, we learned a lot of derivative rules. So this is going to be just a good list of the derivatives of common functions that we have to know. So we need to know how to take the derivative of things that are polynomial in nature. So that's the power rule. The derivative with respect to x of x to the nth power is n times x to the n minus 1. We know that. We've used that every day. We need to know our trig derivatives, and that would be that the derivative of sine x is cosine x. And we need to know the derivatives of the other trig functions including tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent. Okay, we need to know all of those. We also need to know our exponential and log derivative. So, you know, the most important of the, these is that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and that the derivative of natural log x is 1 over x. We also need to know how to take the derivative of exponentials that aren't e to the x, like 2 to the x. So the derivative of 2 to the x would be 2 to the x times the natural log of 2. 
And you can actually show that by, you know, rewriting your a or your two or whatever as e to the log a times x, where log a is just some number and taking the derivative using the chain rule, which I haven't talked about, but I will. And that's, that's you know, a way that we can work around just having that memorized. But you could also just know it. It's very rare that it comes up, but it can come up. Uh, logs with bases other than e, I have not seen those come up. So I, I don't really, I don't focus on that in my class. We also need to know our arc trig derivatives. The derivative of arc sine of x is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. The derivative of arc cosine is negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And the derivative of arc tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And these are things that we just have to know. It may also be helpful for you to know that the derivative of the absolute value of x is equal to the absolute value of x divided by x, but it's not really one of the formulas that we just have to know. We also need to know our derivative rules, like product rule, quotient rule, chain rule. And so just to give you a quick reminder that we take the derivative of the product of f and g by taking the derivative of one of them and leaving the other ones the same, and then adding in, taking the derivative of the other one and leaving the first one the same. Okay. We need to know the quotient rule. And I always like to say the derivative of top divided by bottom, so we aren't tied to f and g, is equal to bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom divided by the bottom squared. That is not what that was supposed to be. Okay, bottom squared. And then we also need to know the chain rule, that the derivative with respect to x of f of g of x where we take the derivative of the outside while leaving the inside the same and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. Okay. One you may have forgotten about is the derivative of the inverse function. Okay, so the derivative, so really what we always say is f n prime equals 1 over f prime of f inverse, where f inverse is some x value. Okay, that's one of those that we have to know. And that one's a little obscure. So, you know, if you're thinking, I don't really remember that, you could go back and look at it. Unit 2, Lesson 4. Or you could look at my third Calculus AB review video, which is kind of obscure topics you may have forgotten about, and that will definitely be on there. The last thing you need to know about derivatives is the mean value theorem. And this is kind of like the intermediate value theorem, except this is set off by a function being differentiable on a closed interval, or really on differentiable on the open interval and continuous on the closed interval, but we don't really talk about the AP calculus. We say if the function is differentiable, then its average rate of change must equal its instantaneous rate of change at some point in that interval. Which is to say that f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a for some c between a and b. In a specialized case of this would be Rolle's theorem, where if the f of a was equal to f of b, then you have some sort of horizontal tangent, provided that your function is differentiable throughout the entire interval. In unit three, we studied function analysis, and so, you know, making drawing conclusions about functions based on their derivatives. And we built a little three-column chart, and I'm just going to pull that up on screen. Okay, so we built this chart, you know, that a function is increasing if the graph is going up. So characterized by the derivative being positive and decreasing with the derivative being negative. Concave up, okay, the graph is smiling, the derivative is increasing, and the second derivative is positive, right? If we go back up, this is the column for f double prime. Okay, concave down is where the function is frowning, the derivative is decreasing, and the second derivative is negative. A point of inflection is a change of concavity. It's a change of sign in the second derivative. It can be characterized as extrema of the first derivative and places where the attitude changes on the original. Okay. And then we talked about maxima and minima. And, you know, a maximum looks like one of these, a minimum looks like one of these, characterized by a sign change in the derivative. But we can also run the second derivative test over here. And this was something that we spent a lot of time on, and we got 
really pretty solid at. And let's see, we've continued to work on them as we've developed, you know, the theory of integration. So this should be pretty familiar to you. And if you need this chart, um, you can just email me and I, I would send you a copy. As far as implicit differentiation goes, I don't think there's really anything that we need to memorize. We just need to have practice and experience taking the derivative of things that have X and Y commingling, you know, taking the derivative with respect to X. Related rates, there's also not a whole lot that we need to memorize because usually the geometry formulas are just given to you in line with the problem. But there are a couple of geometry formulas that we need to just know. Okay, we need to know that the area of the, that circle is given by pi r squared. And we need to know that the volume of this cube, you know, just provided that these are all, you know, equal side lengths. That was really rough. Okay, let's just try that one more time. See if I can, you know, get that. Okay, sure. X, X, X. This volume is equal to X cubed, and the surface area is 6X squared. They don't give you those. Okay, and I think that, you know, you might also be expected to know that the circumference of a circle is 2 times pi times the radius. And that's about all that you would be expected to memorize. Pardon me. No, it's not. I forgot. We need to know that the area of a triangle that has a base B and height H is given by 1 half times base times height. Suppose we would also need to know the area of a trapezoid because of the way that we do the trapezoid sums, but I haven't really had any problems with people not knowing these formulas, so I'm just going to move on. In the fifth unit, we studied differential equations. And this is another one where there wasn't well, that much to memorize and experience was the best teacher. But one thing I can tell you is that the instructions find the particular solution means that you are doing separation of variables. And those are pretty high stakes problems on the free response because they come with a lot of points attached to them. And if you don't do separation of variables, you get none of the points. So that is something that I would, you know, commit to memory. When you're instructed to find the particular solution, you are doing that in this class with separation of variables. In unit six, we started learning about integrals. Okay, so we definitely need to know the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says that we can compute a definite integral by computing the net change in the antiderivative on the interval of integration. And then we also applied this to some rectilinear motion situations. Now, I'm pretty sure that we all know and agree that velocity is the derivative of position and acceleration is the derivative of velocity and acceleration is the second derivative of position. So I'm not going to write those down. I'm going to write down the things that we just have to have memorized that aren't you know, entirely obvious. I need you to know that speed is equal to the absolute value of velocity. I need you to know that total distance is given by the integral from time one to time two of speed. And maybe I'd write that as V of T dt. V of T is absolute value dt. Right? And that we can get displacement by integrating velocity without the absolute values. But that's, again, that's fundamental theorem that, you know, the change in position is going to be given by the definite integral of velocity. We also need to know how to take a Riemann sum and how to determine if a Riemann sum is an overestimate or an underestimate, depending on the type of sum you're taking and, you know, certain aspects of the function, like whether it's increasing or decreasing for a left or right Riemann sum, or whether it's concave up or concave down for a trapezoidal sum. But that's, we've been pretty good at that, and that's, I don't think that's something you really need to memorize. You just need to know the process, and so I'm not going to write it here. The only other thing I remember from the sixth unit that I would really need to put on, oh, i got two things, actually, is the idea of average value. So the average value of a function f of x on a closed interval a to b is going to be equal to 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Whatever we're averaging, we're integrating and dividing. Uh, it's kind of like the thing we add them all up and then we divide. Okay. And then the other thing that you might want to know is, you know, kind of just the restatement of the fundamental theorem where we add f of a to both sides, I think, which is that f of b equals 
f of a plus the integral from a to b of f prime of x dx. This helps us solve lots of applied problems. Um, this helps us find an ending position when giving a, given a starting position and a velocity function. This is a very useful formula for us. In the seventh unit, we learned about functions defined by integrals. And, well, I think what I need to tell you about is the second fundamental theorem of calculus, which is we take the derivative with respect to x of the integral from some number up to x of f of t dt by throwing the upper bound in wherever we see the dummy variable in the integrand. So not f of t, but f of x. Okay. And that we can kind of spice this up a little bit by, you know, instead of going from a to x, going from something like a to x squared or a to cosine x or a to g of x. And so that'll be very similar. You know, we plug in the upper bound where we see the dummy variable in the integrand. But then in this case, we'll need to multiply by the derivative for the chain rule. And I think that's probably, you know, the rate in, rate out scenarios. There's some things that we need to know about that. But I think that, again, the we're pretty fresh on those. And I'm already over 15 minutes. So I think that I'm going to kind of just leave functions defined by integrals right there. And in the last unit of calculus AB, we learned about area and volume. And now this year, I don't think we didn't do any volume. But in general, in calculus AB, you, you need to be able to, to do the volumes as well as the areas. So I'm going to tell you about all of those right now, all those formulas that we need to know. So first, we've got area between two curves. So that, you know, if I had two graphs, like maybe this was f of x and this one was g of x, and they intersected right here at a and b, then the area of this region that I'm shading in yellow is going to be given by the integral from a to b of top minus bottom. So in this case, f of x is on top, right? Because if you trace it back to the region in yellow, f of x is the curve that's on top. And so it's going to be f of x minus g of x dx. Okay? This school year, um, you know, 2021, 2022, this is as far as we went in unit eight before the end of the first semester. But, you know, in general, in this unit, you know, we need to know about our volumes as well. And so I'm thinking for future years, I'll need to be able to do the volume formulas. And I'm just going to flash those up on screen for you. So we need to know how to integrate by disks, washers, and known cross sections. We need to be able to do it with respect to x and with respect to y, but you know, presumably you have a lot of experience with that and you know you just got done doing it because you know, you're at the end of calculus AB. And so this is the list of things that we need to know for AP calculus AB. And I don't think I've got anything else, but if there's anything I forgot, you can just let me know in the comments. And thanks for watching.